with the unstable carotid plaque. I'm Dr. Athirath from SRMC Chennai. Uh, so coming to the topic, uh, first let us discuss what is the mechanism of stroke, the stroke in carotid atherosclerosis. Uh, autopsy studies in the early 1950s confirmed an association between atherosclerotic plaque in the carotid artery, bifurcation and the stroke. The vast majority of strokes from carotid artery plaques are due to focal ischemic brain injury. Uh, my colleague Dr. Arun has told you in the previous class the two types of strokes which are ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. We in our practice uh, more commonly deal with an ischemic stroke. Uh, the two com common mechanisms postulated for ischemic stroke are either it can be due to a flow restriction due to a tight stenosis or an embolic infarction due to plaque disruption. Most strokes, however, do not occur in the watershed areas of the brain. Uh, these are the various uh, causes uh, for an ischemic stroke. Uh, it can be broadly classified into a cardiogenic uh, cause, non-cardiogenic cause. Cardiogenic causes include a cardiogenic emboli, uh, uh, a thrombus in the left ventricle, and a valvular disease and an atrial fibrillation. Uh, non-cardiogenic causes include plaques in the aortic arch or the brachiocephalic trunk, or um, in the carotid bifurcation or it can be due to a flow reducing carotid stenosis or in the intracranial atherosclerosis but we most commonly deal with a flow reducing carotid stenosis and an embolizing carotid plaque a, a flow restriction from luminal encroachment can occur in extremely tight stenosis in the presence of inadequate cross uh, collateralization across brain hemispheres which results in hypoperfusion and this indirectly leads to stroke. And uh, for uh, emboli in the carotid bifurcation causing as a stroke, there are uh, numerous evidences uh, which show that microemboli have been detected in the middle cerebral artery of several patients with symptomatic carotid stenosis. So, carot but uh, of the two mechanisms, carotid plaque disruption with embolic cerebral infarction rather than hemodynamic compromise from luminal narrowing is therefore the primary contributor in the pathogenesis of stroke in patients with carotid atherosclerotic stenosis. Uh, coming to the uh, different types of plaques, broadly they are classified into a stable or an unstable plaque. Uh, stable plaque is something which is quiescent and which contributes to majority of the plaques. Unstable plaque uh, contributes to a minor, uh, min minor proportion which is vulnerable to disruption, leading to atherioembolization and brain infarction. The percent diameter reduction in the carotid artery lumen is currently used as a marker for identifying plaques that may be vulnerable to disruption. But, however, it has been shown that increasing degree of stenosis have not been consistently associated with a correspondingly increased risk for stroke in asymptomatic patients. Neither ACS nor ACST studies have shown a correlation between the degree of stenosis and the stroke risk. Therefore, uh, the degree of stenosis is not an adequately sensitive or specific factor for determining plaque instability and stroke. We need to know about the vulnerability of a plaque. Uh, coming to the next topic, that is histomorphology of an unstable carotid plaque. Uh, our understanding of plaque histology comes largely from studies of the coronary arteries and the iota, which has been sub subsequently substantiated into the studies of the carotid arteries. Uh, atherosclerotic plaques can be broadly classified as an early plaque or a later advanced plaque. Early plaque is uh, uh, type 1, 2 and 3, whereas later advanced plaque is type 4, 5 and 6. Uh, you can see this in an image. Uh, the type 1 plaque is an initial lesion with foam cells. Uh, we uh, commonly call it as a fatty streak. Uh, type 2 is a fatty streak with multiple foam cell layers. Whereas type 3 is a pre-atheroma with an extracellular lipid pools. Type 4 is an atheroma with a confluent extracellular lipid pores. Type 5 is a fibroatheroma. Type 6 is a complex plaque with uh, numerous complications like a surface defect or an intraplaque hemorrhage or a thrombus. This is another uh, thing where there is a plaque, plaque can be type 7 and type 8 also. Type 7 is a calcified plaque. Type 8 is a fibrotic plaque without any lipid pore. Uh, so, in this image, you can see uh, the cal uh, 7, which is a calcified plaque, and 8, which is a fibrotic plaque without any lipid pore. Uh, so, 5 to 8 are generally an unstable plaque, uh, whereas 1 to 4 can be considered as a stable plaque. So, what is a vulnerable plaque? Uh, any plaque ha um, having the, all these features can be called as a vulnerable plaque. Uh, that is, uh, 
plaque which has uh, high inflammatory activity as shown by uh, numerous inflammatory cells like macrophages and lymphocytes and they secreting uh, numerous metalloproteinases and cytokines and any plaque which is having neovascularization leading to intraplaque hemorrhage and uh, thinning of the fibrous cap, uh, lipid rich necrotic pore and uh, thrombus within the plaque and uh, fragilization and apoptosis. Uh, whenever a plaque is located close to the flow lumen uh, with the uh, intraplaque hemorrhage, fibrous cap disruption and luminal surface ulceration. The microscope, this, this is the image of a macroscopic uh, appearance of a plaque with an intraplaque hemorrhage. So what is the basic difference between an unstable plaque and a stable plaque? Unstable plaque are basically etheromatous, whereas stable plaques are fibrous, more of fibrous content. And unstable plaques will be having the thin fibrous cap, a uh, large lipid core with less collagen, whereas a stable plaque will be having thick fibrous cap with small lipid core and highly rich in collagen. Unstable plaques are non-calcified, whereas stable plaques are calcified. Uh, unstable plaques have ulceration, whereas stable plaques will have no ulceration. And there are other complications in unstable plaques, which is intraplaque hemorrhage, infiltration of inflammatory cells, which will not be seen in stable plaques. Now, the basic discussion is, does all the patients with unstable plaques develop symptoms? Uh, the answer is no, because uh, it has been shown that 50% of asymptomatic patients with keratin stenosis have identifiable intraplaque hemorrhage or fibrous cap rupture, yet only 2% of these asymptomatic patients develop a neurologic event at one year. Therefore, we can conclude by telling that morphology alone has very limited ability to identify unstable carotid plaques and predict future strokes. Uh, something which needs to be considered along with the morphology is the biomechanics of the unstable carotid plaque. Histomorphology of plaques is never static. It keeps on changing from one morphologic type to another in response to numerous biological influences such as inflammation and oxidative stress. These biological influences will in turn be influenced by mechanically induced signals which include wall shear stress and plaque wall stress. Now, what is wall shear stress? It is a frictional force exerted on the luminal surface by the flowing blood. There might be a short-term elevations or long-term elevations in this wall shear stress. Short-term elevations uh, will activate endothelial cell signals, which induces nitric oxide and prostacyclin production, which result in uh, further vasodilatation. Whereas long-term elevations uh, will impact numerous uh, function, uh, have numerous impacts, like the endothelial function will be altered, there will be alteration in the wall permeability, uh, plaque formation, vessel wall remodeling, there will be progression of the plaque, and there will also be changes in the plaque composition, which leads to a more vulnerable plaque. So, in the, uh, basically, whenever there are numerous inflammatory cells uh, within a plaque, uh, they, they get activated in response to wall shear stress, and they secrete matrix metalloproteinases, which uh, disturb the balance between the extracellular matrix synthesis versus degradation, which leads to thinning of the fibrous cap and uh, converting a stable plaque to an unstable plaque. As you can see in this image, uh, there will be low wall shear stress and high wall shear stress. Uh, you can see in this image that high wall shear stress uh, increases the necrotic core area, plaque burden and the plaque vulnerability. There's something called uh, blood pressure induced forces, which is a plaque wall stress, which exceeds the plaque material strength, leading to plaque disruption. So repetitive deformation of plaques from the cardiac cycle induced motion can result in excessive plaque strain and tissue fatigue that may also contribute to disruption of the plaque. Uh, due to its high temporal resolution, duplex ultrasonography is well suited for imaging plaque motion, plaque deformation and plaque strain during the cardiac cycle. Uh, it, duplex ultrasonography has also identified asymmetric discordant motion with high strain patterns in carotid plaques from symptomatic patients when compared to the asymptomatic patients. Uh, these are the different types of vulnerable plaques. Uh, uh, the first one is normal. Uh, a, you can see a rupture prone plaque with a large lipid core and a thin fibrous cap and microphages. Rupture, B is a ruptured plaque with a subocclusive thrombus and a ruptured cap. C is an erosion-prone smooth muscle cell-rich plaque with a proteoglycan matrix. Uh, D is eroded plaque with a subocclusive thrombus. E is intraplaque hemorrhage from the vasa vasorum. F is calcified nodule protruding into the vessel lumen. G is chronical, critically stenotic plaque with extensive calcification and an old thrombus. So all these eight types are different types of vulnerable plaque which needs to be considered. 
coming to the ident non invasive identification of the unstable carotid plug. So, uh, as I've already told you, carotid plug disruption results from a combination of both biological and histomorphological changes. So, uh, there are several non invasive images, uh, imaging techniques which I help, it, help us in identifying these histomorphologic features such as lipid rich necrotic core and intraplaque hemorrhage, and also biomechanical uh, markers like wall shear stress and plug uh, strain. So, what is the advantages of these all non invasive imaging techniques? They help, they help us in uh, stratifying asymptomatic patients for the treatment and uh, uh, serial assessments can be known, can be made out in uh, while we keep the patients on potential uh, plaque stabilizing pharmacotherapy. It also helps us in guide uh, in guiding for appropriate stent designs. But the challenge lies in developing image techniques which can reveal this level of structural detail. So, what are the different types of non-invasive techniques which are available? Uh, basically, uh, ultrasound, MRI, CT. PET CT and uh, SPECT. Uh, coming to ultrasound, it is available in both uh, two dimen uh, 2D um, mode imaging and the three dimensional imaging. Uh, ultrasound is basically cost effective, it is safe for serial testing, and along with this, it provides additional physiological information enabling measurement of disruptive forces acting on the plaque. Magnetic resonance imaging is a sensitive and specific method for determining plaque histomorphology, biomechanical forces, and metabolic activity. Uh, CT is not at present not very accurate in delineating plaque composition, but it is, however, useful for identifying the luminal surface. Ultrasonography, coming to the first non invasive imaging technique that is ultrasonography, it is uh, discussed under various side headings so that is, two dimensional B mode imaging, ultrasonographic virtual histology, three dimensional ultrasonography, uh, contrast enhanced ultrasonography, and plaque strain measurement. Coming to two dimensional B mode imaging, uh, B mode imaging basically displays anatomic wall features, which can range from primarily hyperechoic to hypoechoic to heterogeneous in echogenicity. Uh, since different tissues reflect ultrasound to varying degrees, the first histologic interpretation of the B mode appearance of carotid plaques was a subjective visual classification, which is the gray wheel classification. So there will be four types in the gray wheel classification. The type one is echolucent. Type 2 is predominantly echolucent, type 3 is predominantly echogenic, and type 4 is echogenic. So basically, this echolucent echogenic will uh, depend on the uh, composition of the plaque. There's one more classification, which is the zero lacis classification, uh, which is mainly uh, if, is divided into uh, five types. Uh, this depends on the echoes uh, which occupy the percentage of the plaque. In type 1, it, bright echoes will occupy less than 15% of the plaque. In type 2, bright echoes will occupy 15 to 50%. In type 3, bright echoes occupy 50% to 85%. In type 4, bright echoes occupy greater than 85%. And there's an type 5 is a calcified cap uh, with an acoustic shadow. So these are the images. Uh, as you can see, type 1 is an echolucent plaque, uh, which is the most dangerous plaque, I mean, uh, of all the types. Uh, type 2 is, uh, which is completely blocked. Uh, because it is uh, this echolucent plaque will mostly contain lipid rich uh, composition. Uh, type 2 is predominantly echolucent. Uh, type 3 is predominantly echogenic. Uh, type 4 is echogenic. Uh, this echogenic plaque mostly constitutes collagen and fibrotic uh, components. And type 5 is a calcified plaque. Uh, as I have told you, type 1 and type 2 has high risk of uh, neurologic symptoms and stroke. Whereas type 3 and type 4, when compared to the other two, have lower risk of uh, stroke. So, what is the problem with this gray wheel classification is that uh, it is a basically a subjective visual classification. Therefore, there's a high chance of uh, observer variability uh, being present, both during image acquisition and image interpretation. Therefore, Nicolaitis and his group have subsequently introduced standardization in the image acquisition and normalization of image brightness. Uh, leading to the further concept of grayscale median value. Uh, therefore, initially the plaque will be outlined and the median brightness of all the pixels is taken in a single longitudinal image of the plaque and it is expressed as a grayscale median value. Uh, as you can see, uh, the type uh, image A will be showing uh, the B mode image of the uh, plaque in the character 
and uh, D is a colored uh, Doppler showing the flow th uh, through the stenosis. And what we do in a gray, uh, this analysis is we crop the plaque image and we take uh, uh, echoes of uh, signal intensities from each longitudinal image and we plot it on a graph and we take the median value, which is called as a grayscale median value of this plaque. Uh, this is the same again, uh, but as uh, in this image, I'd like to tell you in this, uh, the first image that is A, uh, you can see the red circle within the plaque, which is shown by an arrow. Uh, so this demonstrates something called as a juxtaluminal black area, uh, which is, uh, which indicates that the plaque is rich in necrotic content and uh, neoangiogenesis. So whenever there is this, uh, Juxtaluminal black area is uh, located close to the plaque, uh, then there's a high risk of plaque disruption. And there is something called as uh, DWA, that is uh, diffusion white, uh, white area within the uh, plaque, uh, which is uh, something which does not produce an acoustic shadow. And this also indicates a bad uh, sign within the image. So in order to remove variability associated with acquisition of ultrasound image, the ultrasound images are normalized using linear scaling so that Adventitia would have a grayscale median value of 185 to 195 and bled within 0 to 5. So the plaque intensity will be between these uh, values and uh, we'll take a median uh, value of all the because the plaque is uh, het mostly heterogeneous in echogenicity. So histologic studies have shown that the necrotic core of a symptomatic plaque is located closer to the luminal surface than in an asymptomatic plaque. So this necrotic core is actually that juxtaluminal black area, which appears hypoechoic, uh, like black color on the ultra ultrasound image in the B mode image. And in the asymptomatic carotid stenosis and risk of stroke trial, a juxtaluminal black area of eight to ten millimeters square represented an annual risk of stroke of three point two percent. When the and when the area is greater than ten millimeters square, the stroke rate was about five percent. Coming to the next topic, ultrasonographic virtual histology. Uh, as I've told you, different tissues in the plaque will reflect ultrasound differentially, resulting in B-mode image with variable brightness or pixel intensities. Uh, using this key principle, this, cons uh, this technique has come into force. Uh, that is, the echogenicity of key histologic components of atherosclerotic plaques will be noted, like calcium, fibromuscular tissue, lipid-rich necrotic core, and intraplaque hemorrhage. And these pixel intensities ranges are mapped in a normalized longitudinal images of the cropped carotid plaque. Uh, that is the pixel distribution analysis to measure the virtual histology of individual tissue and architectural features of the plaques. As I've told you, the, this is the cropped image of the plaque, which uh, has numerous components. So each component will be having uh, different pixel distribution analysis and each pixel, uh, each component will be given a color coding. And when you, uh, Project it into the cropped plaque image, you get the image which is shown in the down, uh, down image. And as if you can see, this, uh, there's a white box within this uh, cropped image, uh, the color virtual histology, that uh, indicates the juxtaluminal black area. Now, in this image, you can see that the different components will be given different uh, color coding, like blood will be given red color, uh, fat will be given green, uh, muscle will be given blue, Fibrous tissue will be given light blue and the calcium will be given a yellow color. Uh, now, why it will require this is that the pixel distribution analysis approach provides quantification of the carotid plaque histomorphology using simple and readily available B mode ultrasound technology. Therefore, symptomatic plaques will have larger quantities of intra plaque hemorrhage, whereas asymptomatic plaques will have large amounts of calcium. Uh, coming to the next topic, that is a three dimensional ultrasonography. Uh, plaques progress along the vessel 2.4 times faster than they thicken. Therefore, we require methods which capture both longitudinal and circumferential growth of the plaque rather than uh, techniques which are limited only to thickness measurements, that is, diameter reducing stenosis. Uh, the advantage when we capture both longitudinal and circumferential growth is that we can know the area and volume of the plaque which is actually present at the carotid bifurcation. Uh, why we need to know, uh, know about this is that uh, the five year risk of stroke or other complications is about 19% when the longitudinal cross sectional area of the plaque is 1.2 to 6.7 centimeters square, compared to 6% when the area is about 0 to 0 0.1 centimeters square. 
three dim uh, what so what we actually do in this three dimensional ultrasonography is that we take a series of 2d cross sectional slices and we collate them and uh, reconstruct them into a 3d volume but for performing this three dimensional ultrasonography we require a special 3d transducer with a motorized linear array transducer that moves within a housing to capture a series of 2d image frames uh, but what we need to know is that the operator's hand and the patient's head must be studied to prevent motion artifacts and in this three dimensional imaging the lumen intima boundary which is actually the plaque surface and the outer wall boundary which is the outer surface of the plaque are segmented in each image and the region between this uh, lumen intima boundary and the outer wall boundary is actually the vessel wall containing the plaque so the stacked 2d images will be collated to develop a volume rendered reconstruction after which we'll uh, get to know the total plaque volume so in this image you can see that uh, the, the these slices are the 2d slices which will be collated in the software uh, to construct a 3D volume. You can see the intima media complex and the media adventitia boundary. Now, what is the actual use of a uh, 3D ultrasound? Why do we actually need it? Uh, the thing is, when we perform a 2D B-mode imaging, uh, the chances of, uh, there'll be a 19% difference or more in the corrected plaque area when uh, between two scans on a patient. That is a minimum detectable change in a B mode imaging. Whereas when we take a 3D imaging, that uh, that change uh, that uh, difference will be declined to almost about to 12.9 percent when two different technologies perform, and almost about to 4.5 percent when the same technologies perform. Now, what are the advantages of 3D ultrasound? Uh, it reduces, as I told you, it reduces the operator variability, and it takes less than a second to capture the entire uh, volume and the area. Therefore, this uh, minimizes the artifact from cardiac and respiratory movements, and it reliably detects plaque volume changes as low as 4% to 6% with 95% confidence interval, and there'll be improved ability to evaluate the plaque surface. Coming to the next topic, contrast enhanced ultrasonography. Uh, on, this has traditionally been used in cardiac echocardiography, but now in recent times, it has also been used in carotid ultrasonography. Uh, basically, this is a type of B-mode imaging only, but the B-mode imaging will be taken after we administer an intravenous contrast agent because this helps in the delineation of structures where the contrast can reach. So what is the contrast which is used in ultrasound technology is a 1 to 10 micron micro bubble of an inert gas usually stabilized by a phospholipid shell. So these micro bubbles will stay in the vascular system for a few minutes and later they will be eliminated by the respiratory tract. Now what is the advantage of ultrasound contrast is that unlike CT contrast it is not nephrotoxic it will not require any radiation and uh, complications are highly uncommon. Uh, so whenever you uh, uh, see at the image of a contrast enhanced ultrasonography, the plaque in the intima media complex will appear hypoechoic, that is black, black when, whereas the carotid lumen and adventitia will appear enhanced. Therefore, this improves visualization of luminary irregularities, thereby improving the detection of ulcerated plaques. Uh, one more most important uh, advantage of contrast enhanced ultrasonography is that we can get to know about increased neovascularization within the plaque, which appears as increased enhancement within the uh, plaque. Now, this is a image of a contrast enhanced ultrasonography. Uh, B image is a B mode image, uh, which you routinely see. So, once when you give contrast, the intima media uh, uh, will appear uh, hypoechoic, that is black, whereas the uh, uh, Blood, uh, lumen and the adventitia will appear uh, enhanced. The arrows which you can see in this aim image are the specks of uh, neovascularization which can be seen within the plaque. So whenever there is intraplaque neovascularization, there will be a scoring method. As you can see in all these three images, uh, the yellow dotted line actually outlines the plaque lesion, whereas the yellow circles within the plaque uh, depicts the intraplaque contrast microbubbles, uh, suggesting uh, neovascularization. So score 0 indicates that there will be no visible micro bubbles within the plaque. Score 1 will tell minimal micro bubbles confined to periadventitial area. Score 2 is micro bubbles present throughout the plaque core. So uh, some carotid plaques even after administration of ultrasound contrast will remain enhanced for up to 30 minutes post injection. Now is this a good sign or a bad sign? This is definitely a bad sign because there is uh, this indicates that there is uh, high amount of uh, neo uh, neovascularization within the plaque. 
But why will this actually occur is uh, any vulnerable plaque will have high amount of inflammatory activity and inflammatory cells like monocytes or macrophages. So these micro bubbles will be ingested by these monocytes. And as it is an inflammatory plaque, these monocytes will get adhered to the inflamed endothelium, uh, which retains the contrast for a longer time period. Therefore, increased presence of inflammatory cells will result in late phase enhancement, which suggests plaque instability. Uh, but what the late phase enhancement offers an opportunity to develop novel contrast agents that will generate molecular images of the keratoid plaque. Coming to the next topic, that is a plaque strain measurement. Uh, the motion of keratoid plaques and its associated arterial wall can be complex and may play a role in plaque rupture. Keratoid plaques with increased mobility or with asymmetric discordant motion may have an increased risk for disruption. Therefore, we require uh, something called as ultrasound elastography or strain imaging, which visualizes and quantifies the deformation that tissues undergo in response to a force. Measurement of keratoid plaque deformation has been challenging because of the small target size and its uh, and the plaque mobility noted during cardiac and respiratory cycles. Therefore, there's a new imaging technique that is an optical tracking technique, which allow quantification of the direction, extent, and rate of movement of the individual plexus, pixels within a plaque image throughout the cardiac cycle. The, uh, uh, displacement of plaques can occur uh, along the length of the artery, which is due to blood flow, or radially due to pulsatile expansion of the artery. Therefore, uh, data must be acquired in both the planes, that is uh, longitudinal and transverse plane. Uh, studies using radio frequency ultrasound protocols have found that increased strain patterns correlated with high risk histomorphologic features. Next topic is intravascular ultrasound. This is actually an invasive technique and a non, not a non invasive technique. Uh, but uh, what is the basic uh, uh, advantage of intravascular ultrasound? I'll tell you later. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, we need to know about the information of morphologic characteristics of a carotid plaque. Uh, which are important at the time planning for a carotid intervention. For example, endovascular instrumentation of a soft plaque could provoke embolization or a stiff calcified plaque could prevent stent expansion during carotid artery stenting. Uh, as periprocedural stroke is very frequent in carotid artery stenting, hence every attempt should be made to reduce embolization during stenting. Now, how does intravascular ultrasound helps us in knowing is that we can know the plaque uh, compass, I mean plaque consistency of the morphology in an intravascular ultrasound. Uh, we can also use something called as duplex ultrasound. With, as, as I've told you, there's something called as intravascular ultrasound virtual histology also, like duplex ultrasound virtual histology. The intravascular ultrasound uses the intensity and frequency of reflected uh, ultrasound waves to provide a map of the histologic components of the plaque. And uh, the accuracy of this intravascular ultrasound virtual histology is of about 72.4% for calcified fibroatheroma and of about 99.4% for thin cap fibroatheroma. Uh, as you can see in this image, uh, the diff when you use an intravascular ultrasound uh, virtual histology, the different components of the plaque will be coded with a different color and you can actually know the composition of the plaque and the consistency of the plaque, which will help you in guiding whether stenting is really feasible or possible. Uh, the green color is shown, dark green is fibrotic, uh, light green is about fibro fatty tissue, uh, white is a calcium, and uh, red is like necrotic pore. Now, uh, the different uh, plaque classification by virtual histology, IVAS. Uh, the, this is a pathologic intimal thickening, that is, uh, mainly it is a fibro fatty plaque with less than 10% necrotic core. The, this one is a fibrotic uh, plaque, uh, the fourth one which is a mainly fibrous tissue with less than 10% confluent necrotic core, less than 10% calcium. And the fifth one is a fibrocalcific plaque, which is mainly fibrous tissue with greater than 10% uh, calcium, but less than 10% confluent necrotic core. Uh, the first two ones are uh, fibroatheromas. Uh, the first one is a thin cap fibroatheroma, which is highly prone to rupture. The second one is a thick cap fibroatheroma, which is comparatively better when compared to the thin cap fibroatheroma. But the problem is that IBUS has not routinely been used in carotid arteries because its role is not very well established. It is an invasive procedure and its utility must be weighed against the risk of inducing a stroke from passing the ultrasound catheter across the lesion. The next one is a magnetic resonance imaging for histomorphology. Uh, MRI uh, basically identifies large lipid rich necrotic core, intraplaque hemorrhage, and luminal surface ulceration accurately and with good reproducibility. 
uh, previous days, traditionally, we have been using long duration scanning protocols using customized carotid coils. But the problem uh, with this is that uh, it takes a long time to get a sufficient tissue detail. But uh, re in recent advances, there have been advances in the 3D MRI protocols, which have reduced the scan times and which permit differentiation of di disrupted versus intact carotid plugs and detection of intraplex hemorrhage and lipid rich ne necrotic core. Histologic studies indicate that enlarging lipid rich necrotic cores, presence of intraplug hemorrhage, fibrous cap thinning or ulceration are precursors of plug disruption and they could serve as imaging markers of stroke risk. And uh, studies have proven that MRI has identified these features with uh, high conformability in symptomatic car uh, carotid plugs. Uh, so this is another classification of a plug surface. Uh, Whenever we get to know about the plug surface, type 1 is a smooth surface, type 2 is an irregular surface, type 3 is an ulcerated surface, type 4 is ulcerated with thrombus, type 5 is thrombus without any ulceration. Now, we can combine magnetic resonance imaging and ultrasonography uh, to know about the biomechanics of the plug, which is even more advantage, uh, will have an even more advantage. Uh, direct in vivo measurement of wall shear stress in patient uh, carotid bifurcations is very difficult to obtain. Uh, therefore, when MRI is combined, uh, luminal geometry from MRI is combined with uh, flow wave from, from Doppler, uh, duplex ultrasound, uh, patient specific computational fluid dynamic models can be constructed. Uh, the, these models can yield the velocity, pressure, and wall shear stress fields at all points along the vessel wall. Using this approach, 60% of greater carotid stenosis uh, has a higher mean of wall shear stress that is greater than 100 times per centimeter square when compared with normal or minimal stenosis, with, will, which will have less than 60 per, uh, times per centimeter square wall shear stress. And it has uh, been found that wall shear stress is generally higher in plaques with intra plug hemorrhage and lipid rich necrotic core compared with those without. And ulcerated plaques will also have higher plaque wall stress and wall shear strikes. This indicates possible links between biomechanical forces and plaque histomorphology features, and uh, both of them will be uh, associated with adverse neurologic outcomes. Uh, so I would like to summarize this topic by telling that uh, estimation of degree of stenosis based on Doppler velocity measurements is currently the most well established role of ultrasonography in the diagnostic workup of a carotid atherosclerotic disease. But along with the degree of stenosis, we also need to know about additional information on the plaque uh, because say, there are certain characteristics of the plaque, such as volume of the plaque, lipid rich necrotic core, size and location, surface ulceration, intra plaque hemorrhage, uh, which has hemodynamic effects around the plaque and uh, are associated with an increased risk of stroke. Uh, one uh, summarize about all imaging non-invasive imaging techniques. 2D imaging techniques uh, will have a grayscale media analysis, ultrasonographic virtual histology using pixel distribution analysis. It also gives us about the analysis of the image texture. This gives about information of plaque composition and architecture. 3D imaging technique uh, gives us an opportunity to reduce observer dependence and to sample the entire plaque for volumetric and surface assessments. Contrast enhanced ultrasonography will tell us about neovascularization within the plug. Intravascular ultrasound is an invasive imaging technique, but is, it helps us in assisting in planning an endovascular procedure. MRI gives us information about uh, numerous complications of a vulnerable plug like intraplug hemorrhage, lipid rich necrotic core, and a thin fibrous caps. Ultrasonography and MRI together will offer an opportunity to quantify biomechanical forces acting on the plug. This is a table of all the uh, non-invasive imaging techniques. Uh, this PET and SPECT are uh, basically we use fl fluorodeoxy glucose. Uh, vulnerable plaque will have high amount of inflammatory activity. So this glucose will be taken up by that and it can be shown on the PET, but it is PET is for plaque morphology is not routinely used. Thank you.